Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in for training on Diamondback Terrapin. We're going to talk today about uh, the Diamondback Terrapin, the issues with the Diamondback Terrapin, and then the process or procedure to go through if you want to be a volunteer with our Terrapin project, uh, what you're going to be asked to do and how to do it. And we'll send you all the information. When we're all done, there'll be an email where you can contact me and say, hey, I really want, I like this and I want to sign up and do it. Uh, so I'm Rick O'Connor, I'm with the Escambia County Extension Office, uh, I'm the Sea Grant agent there and one of the animals we are monitoring in our bay system is a small brackish water turtle called a terrapin. And for most folks around here, they've never actually seen this thing before. Uh, they may or may not have heard of one, anybody from Maryland certainly has, uh, but folks down here may not have even heard of the animal terrapin. This is it. Um, it's full grown. She's a female and she's full grown. So about the size of a Nerf football. That's as big as they get. It's the only resident brackish water turtle in the United States. Uh, we do have marine or sea turtles that like the open ocean and the salinities at 35 parts per thousand. And of course, numerous kinds of turtles that will live in freshwater lakes, ponds and rivers. But this is the only one who calls the bay or the estuary home. Uh, one of the things you'll notice about it is the skin is awfully light in color. Most turtles have very dark skin. If they have markings at all, the, the markings might be a white or a, a yellow, sometimes red. What you'll see with this turtle is that the skin is very, very white, almost a light gray-blue color. And if it's got markings, this one has speckles all over her body. Uh, sometimes you'll see black stripes. But this is the Diamondback Terrapin. And what she calls home is that area out there. That is the salt marsh, and that is where she likes to be. She'll spend her entire life, and he, they will spend their entire lives in these salt marshes, basically moving around during the day, eating a variety of different shellfish, um, basking in the sun during the daytime, and then when it gets cold in the wintertime in the northern ranges where the animal lives, uh, they'll actually go into the mud below the water line. They can get enough oxygen through their cloaca that they can actually slow their heart rate and breathing rate and stay alive submerged underwater. But we've also noticed that they'll come out, actually she was doing it earlier, and actually burrow right into the mud or the sand on shore and we'll spend the winter there. Uh, there are actually seven different kinds of terrapins in the United States, seven different subspecies. They range from Massachusetts all the way to Brownsville, Texas, to the east and Atlantic coast of the United States. Uh, within that area, the seven different uh, subspecies, five of them are found in Florida. Three of those are only found in Florida. Uh, in our neck of the woods here in the Pensacola Bay system, this particular one is known as the ornate terrapin. You'll notice the orange spots on the scutes of the carapace here. This one, according to the books, is only found from Key West to Choctahatchee Bay, about 30 miles to our east. But we have found this individual in the Pensacola Bay system. The one the literature will tell you lives here is the Mississippi Terrapin. It will not have the orange spots on the scutes. The skin is a little bit darker and a lot of the Mississippi Terrapins literally have a mustache on the upper beak, uh, male and female, so they look like they have a mustache. But this is the animal and so this is what the, uh, the uh, Panhandle Terrapin Project's all about. The objective, I'm going to set her down here in the bucket for a second, how she does scratch. Uh, the objective of this project is to really fill in a lot of research gaps. There's been a lot of work done on terrapins across the East Coast and some other parts of the um, Gulf Coast, particularly Alabama, Mississippi, but there's almost nothing in the literature about the Florida Panhandle species. Uh, so when we first started this project back in 2005, question number one, objective number one, is do terrapins even exist here? And the answer is yes. We were monitoring the six counties from Escambia all the way over to the Apalachicola River, and we have found evidence of terrapins in each one. So the next question is, well, what are their numbers? How are the population's doing? Is there any need for any conservation measures, things like that? And obviously FWC and the USGS are very, very interested in the work we're doing up here. So we have been monitoring that for uh, almost 15 years now. Uh, and what we're going to ask you guys to do is to help us continue that monitoring. Of all the different citizen science projects we have, this one can be the most time consuming. So the more volunteers we get, the less time each individual has or has to commit to. But what we really, really want is volunteers to come out to a beach like this. We will show you, we will give you sites of where they're nesting. 
um, and walk that beach at least three times a week, looking for evidence, looking for the turtles, looking for whether or not they're nesting or not. Um, and three times a week is a lot. Uh, we, the nesting season begins April 1 and runs through about the end of June. It starts slowing down. And then from July to September, we have the hatching season. And unlike sea turtles, the babies will hatch in the sand just like the sea turtles, but they generally will run into the grass. They do not head for the water. They head up into the grass and they'll spend their first year higher under this rack, up into the grass. And so we have three months of where we do a lot of uh, monitoring for those. Uh, and three times a week over six months, that's a lot of work. So again, the more volunteers we can get, the less you're going to be asked to do. If we can't get three times a week, as long as we get once a week, that's really good. The other thing we ask is that you try to do your surveys in the morning before noon. If you can't because of your job, we understand that. But the reason why is you'll see from this, the marks that these animals make, let's see if I can get her to make a little track and we'll certainly show you if she doesn't. But as she makes tracks in here, she would be coming up out of the water. Even though she lives in the marsh, she swims out into the open water. I won't let her go too far, but you'll see the tracks that she leaves. These are very, very ephemeral. So if she comes up, and they like to nest in the middle of the day. They're not, they're not nighttime nesters like sea turtles. So they'll come up and they prefer a sunny day. They even see decreased nesting activity when it gets cloudy or rainy. But uh, during wind, or certainly we know uh, in the nesting, I'm sorry, the hatching season in particular, the, the late summer, uh, afternoon thunderstorms are very common. So if she comes up and leaves a track and builds a, or digs a nest, and you don't come till two or three in the afternoon, there's a very good possibility either wind has blown this, or a thunderstorm has washed that away, or something like this. And so you'll end up with footprints that's covering up any evidence that the animal was there. Again, if you can't get out until the afternoon, that's fine. Uh, but we do ask you if there's any way possible to do your surveys before noon for that reason. And what you will do on your surveys, as far as, uh, you know, what do I do if I'm at, once I'm out here? Here's the beach. And again, like I said, they live in the marsh. They will breed in March. The fertilized females will then work their way out of the marsh through a creek or something into the open sound or lagoon and approach the beach from the open water side. It's kind of interesting why they don't just come out of the marsh, but they rarely do that. Uh, so they'll come up on the open water side, they'll cross this open sand, leaving a, hopefully a track, that's how you're going to find them. They'll cross this sand through this grass and try to get to a high point that they know the tide isn't going to reach. And what we have found here in the Northern Gulf is that they like these bushes right here. That's Bacchus and Yopon. They seem to like to go towards the bushes. We actually have some nesting near um, uh, palm trees. Uh, so they tend to go across the sand. Sometimes they'll do open sand or grassy areas like this, but more often than not, we find they, they select the shrub. They will dig a hole, lay about 10 eggs, that's average, and then she'll cover them up and return. And so what you'll see is that she'll come up, make a, a burial, and then come back at a different point. So it makes sort of like two sides of a triangle, and that apex is usually where the eggs are going to be uh, located. So you're going to be looking for the tracks on our data sheet. Yes, I saw tracks. How many tracks did I see? Uh, you're going to go up to these spots and see if you can find. We're not asking you to dig up the eggs. You can put your hand down there. If you feel them, just say, yes, eggs are present. Please do not dig the eggs up. And a lot of times, about 90% of the time, actually, the raccoons will dig them up. So you'll go up there and you'll find eggshells laying around. Uh, and there will be a, a picture of that on this video. So you'll see what those look like. So a lot of times they'll find that. And we call that a depredated nest. On the data sheet, it will say that how many nests did you find and how many D nests or D da dash nests. That's depredated nests. That's a nest that a raccoon has dug up. So uh, we do find those and you'll record that data sheet. So we want to know how many tracks did you see, how many depredated nests, how many actual nests. You're going to walk this beach for however long you go, uh, you're assigned to. And then when you're all done, what we ask you to do is because there might be another volunteer following you later in the week is to put some sort of mark or cover up that track so they don't count it also. Uh, that way we don't think there's two terrapins here, there's actually only one. So we ask you to erase any, you don't have to do the whole thing, but just put a mark through it so the next volunteer coming out realize that one has already been counted. And then that's it, that's pretty much it. Now when you're all done with that, 
um, what we'll ask if you've got time to do is sit around the bank of these lagoons, the waterways where the terrapins actually live, and do a 30 minute head count. Uh, as you can see from the terrapin, they're pretty easy to spot with that big white head, but as far as being able to see this sitting on the bank, it really works best if you've got the sun behind you. So if you can position yourself anyway where the sun is shining on this, uh, those white heads will pop up. Then the question would be like, well, all right, I saw 12 heads. How do I know it wasn't the same animal 12 times? Our argument there, and there's a lot of other researchers doing this method, is that we don't know that. Uh, and in this case, it really doesn't matter. What we know is that on average, if you guys see 12 heads in a 30 minute period, and next year there's 30 heads or 60 heads, we know the population is going up. It's a relative abundance is what we're actually doing. And one of the other things we'll track is frequency of a counter. How many times did you go to the beach and how many times did you find a terrapin or a track or an eggshell? You know, how frequently is this happening? So we got some idea of how common these things actually are here. And the last, but not least in this case, is if you happen to be lucky enough to see her on the beach one day. What we ask you to do if you see her, please bring a five gallon bucket with you like this. You'll just pick her up, put her right in here, and call us. We will put a tag on her. We will put a radio tag or satellite tag on some of these things. We'll get what we call a workup. We'll get some tissue sample. Um, one of the objectives we're also trying to do with FWC is the Mississippi terrapin here, actually genetically isolated from the ornate terrapin, this one. And if that's the case, they are considering possibly listing the Mississippi terrapin in the state of Florida. But we need some genetic, we need some blood, and we need some tissues for that. So we'll get a tissue sample or blood sample, we'll get all the workup on it, the length, we'll get the weight, and then we'll tag her and we'll let her go. Uh, but when you get her, we want to let her go within 24 hours. So we ask you, if you do get lucky enough to catch one of these things, be sure to always have a bucket with you, put it in there and immediately call your site coordinators. I am the regional coordinator for the Western Panhandle. So I cover Escambia, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, and Walton counties. And each one of those counties has a site coordinator. Uh, you, if you decide to do this, you will be connected with your site coordinator and they have all the uh, equipment needed to do this work so you can get to them quicker than maybe I could. But please contact me as well. I'll get there as fast as I can. If you're watching this from the Eastern Panhandle, Bay, Gulf, and Franklin County, your regional coordinator over there is Dan Catazon with USGS. And we will give you his information. So that is what the Terrapin Project is all about, the Panhandle Terrapin Project. If you feel like you would like to volunteer and help us out on this, my email is on the screen. Please call me and we'll go from there.